First Timothy chapter three. I'll begin by reading where we're drawing our topics from, and that's Hebrews chapter 6. It says, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permits. So I'm on to the foundation of laying on of hands foundation of laying on of hands. I thank you, God, for this day, Lord. Help me now. Um, you know how I've prepared, God, but this message is nothing without the unction of your Holy Spirit. I pray, God, you be with me in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're talking about the foundation of the laying on of hands. And as this foundation of series has been so far, these are foundational doctrines, but they're not necessarily simple or basic doctrines. They're, they're a little bit deeper, or at least there's often sort of a, a, a clean base level teaching to it, and then something a little bit deeper that, that uh, is a foundation to the Christian life. But as the Apostle Paul deals with, he's like, I'm not going to lay again this foundation. We're going to move on unto perfection. So before we can get on onto perfection, I believe that the things that he listed here, the next one being the laying on of hands, it needs to be addressed before we can get on to perfection. Now, what I'm dealing with here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, a very famous passage, is the, quote, qualifications of the bishop. Look at 1 Timothy 3. Or 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to, cheat, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So I use that term qualifications of a bishop because we often do. But if you notice, the term qualification actually isn't in that passage. I didn't see it anywhere. Correct? Okay. And this is why many months back I took this passage of scripture and grabbed each one of what we call qualifications. And I applied them essentially to every believer. Because you'll find in the Bible, every one of these points mentioned is a point in a particular context, right? Obviously a woman can't be the husband of one wife, for example. But every point in here is something that actually transcends the bishop and is something that should be a character trait of Christians at large. So again, I don't find the term qualification here. Let's go to the sister passage here, the uh, alike passage in Titus in chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Just a few pages to the right. Titus chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless, as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he might be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Again, the term qualification is not mentioned here. Now my Bible at the top in the asterisks, which are the title added by the publisher, it does say of the qualifications of the minister, but that's sure, certainly not scriptural authority here, though it's up in the heading. <clears throat> so of course this is a viewpoint whenever this was published, that was common 
that the qualifications of a minister are mentioned here. But is it in the word of God? The answer is no. So the charge continues. Now let's look at this. Qualifications for other groups are mentioned over in Titus chapter 2 and in verse 1. Titus 2 and verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Let young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. <clears throat> Again, this group is mentioned, and these are things that they ought to do, but also they're not qualifications. Now, does this mean if these are just all-encompassing lists of what behaviors ought to be indicative of the people mentioned here, does this mean then that aged women, aged men, young men, and young women can be strikers, right? No, it's not on their list. So certainly to be qualified to be an acceptable aged man, young man in the Lord, young woman in the Lord, or aged woman in the Lord, you shouldn't be allowed to be a striker, no doubt, but it's not on their list. So the truth of this passage and what I think it's trying to explain to us is found down in verse 11. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great god and our savior jesus christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works and then he says again to titus these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority let no man despise thee God wants to teach us through the man, here Titus penning this book, that we ought to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present evil world, looking for the blessed hope, the hope of Christ's coming, who gave himself for the purpose of, verse 14 says, purifying a people unto himself. Zealous people, peculiar people, unto good works. A, per, a, a group of people that wants to do good works. These teachings exhort, and these teachings, I believe, are one for all, encompassing. God wants all his people to be peculiar and zealous in the direction and working towards doing good works. Now, regarding specifically the bishops and then the aged men, aged women, and likewise the people that he's teaching, are there, are there specific character requirements? We see the bishop over under believers. Well, if you go to back to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2, you'll see then a bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife. So, of course, the husband of un, one wife signifies in a broader sense purity, faithfulness, and marriage. But is this necessarily a requirement for every believer ever? No, not necessarily. But if you are married, you ought to be pure, you ought to be righteous and holy and set apart and faithful in your marriage as a believer, but specifically for the bishop then, this is one that kind of singles them out and says, hey, they must be then the husband of one wife, okay? Now, <clears throat> these things then listed, can these be checklist roads to being a certified, qualified bishop? Well, first I would say, by my own witness and my own observation and my own, uh, you know, just, just seeing what goes on in the world of bishops, quite often we have many of these checklist failures, I would call them. They check everything on the list. Oh, I've got that. Yes, husband of one wife. Oh, I'm sober. Yes. Oh, I'm of good behavior. Oh, I'm given to hospital. They check the list. And then what happens? Too often they fall short of actually fulfilling the office of a bishop. They end up in scandal. They end up in, in, in harm's way. They end up sinning. They end up falling short. Okay? So just in my own observations, simply checking the list doesn't make you qualified. I think that's pretty clear. We've, we've seen people check the boxes and then end up 
not qualified for the job, okay? Also, just by subjectivity, I don't see this list as being indicative of a list of qualifications. Why do I say that? Patient, okay? Now, what does that mean, patient? How do I check the box patient? Do I never lose my patience? Do, do, I, do I never kind of just blow it and in the flesh, you know, let loose, get angry, or just on a whim? How, what is patience? How much patience do I need? This is like one of those, those questions of repent of your sins we bring to people that say, oh, you got to repent of all your, you got to repent of your sins to be saved. Well, which sins? How many sins? Do I do it often? Do I do it sometimes? Is there a scale? Is it only the bad sins? Okay, you, you see what I mean here? There's a certain amount of subjectivity to that term patience. Any man that has children gets impatient. Any man, in, man, man that has, has, has a spouse will grow impatient. You go to your workplace, you'll grow impatient, right? So, so how do I check that box, patience, okay? Here's the thing. My opinion is, is that, and again, I'm not losing track of the laying on of hands. I'm just kind of building up to this. My opinion is that if these are qualifications of the bishop, if they are, there is nobody qualified on this earth. Okay? Why do I say that? Exactly what I just said. I believe that these, as they encompass the, 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 the duties of a Christian believer at large, could be essentially a list that is the schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. What am I saying? This is a law. This is a law that all have sinned and come short of the glory of. Okay? Let me put an example out there. Jesus Christ, would he be qualified to be an independent, fundamental, Baptist bishop? Husband of one wife? Having children in subjection? Okay. We know Jesus wasn't married. We know Jesus had no children. Okay, well maybe they're spiritual children. Are we in subjection as his spiritual children? Come on. Right? All of God's children are definitely not in subjection, okay? So would Jesus Christ be able to check the list and qualify, if that's what we're going to call this, to be a bishop? The answer has to be no, okay? IFB would disqualify Jesus Christ from the office of a bishop, okay? But is he a bishop? First Peter few pages to the right after Hebrews and James. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25. Verse 21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously who his own self bare our sins. Look, he didn't sin, but he even bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. Look at this. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and what? Bishop of your souls. So if those are qualification checklists of the bishop, is 1 Peter 2 verse 25 lying to us? <laughs> No, it's not. So what are we dealing with here? Of course Jesus Christ is the bishop of our souls. Of course he is. He didn't sin. He didn't sin in so much that he was able to take all of my sins upon him. So what then are we dealing with here? We'll go to 1 Timothy again in chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Again, I believe that if these are qualifications, none are qualified. And I am one of these guys that have heard it Hundreds of times. I mean, give me a dollar for every time somebody tells me I'm not qualified. Okay? You know what I'm going to say? Amen. I'm not. Because I don't believe anybody is. I honestly don't believe anybody is qualified. Because according to the scriptures, we could disqualify, according to the independent Baptist rules, Jesus Christ, our, our Savior. <clears throat> so what's going on here? First Timothy chapter 4. I believe these are prominent, then, qualities character traits of men suitable for the office. And among other things, these are things that men strive for. 
And I showed you all scripturally, and you can go back if you didn't see it, how each and every one of us in this room as Bible-believing Christians is responsible scripturally for each one of these character traits of the bishop, of the believer at large. I said that purposefully. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. What is he saying here then? The bishop then, here Timothy as a bishop, a pastor, an elder, he is expected to be an example of the believers, key word there, of the believers. He's not an example to the believers, as in he's, he's sitting afar off and he's an example to them. He's also not an example above the believers, as some high and lofty one that everyone should look up to and revere. No, he's an example of the believers as a bishop and is expected to, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, be an example of that, of the believers at large. This is why I say that these are just general, prominent, quality, character traits suitable for men of the office, men that desire the office, men that want to approach the office of a bishop and to do that good work, okay? And I'm not trying to negate these things at all. I'm not trying to put them down. Just as much as I would not take any of the Ten Commandments and try to tell you that this one's more important than that one, and you don't really need to worry about this one, but this one, definitely make sure you don't commit that sin. I wouldn't say that of any of the sins. But I also wouldn't stand before you and say, I've kept them all, right? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. And the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ in as much as these list of qualities of the bishop, the bishop then must be all these things, are simply schoolmaster laws to bring us to Christ. To bring us to the point where we're like, I can't do it. I'm not qualified. I can't do this. And this all makes sense. Why? Because, look, I'm not the head of the church. And even one day when I'm ordained, I will still not be the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. And every single time I come to a thou shalt not or thou shalt or thou shalt be or be patient and I lose my patience, I'm taught as the schoolmaster teaches and brought to Christ to ask for forgiveness. Okay? So then, what makes, if I'm saying that all Christians are responsible for this list and all of us have sinned and come short of these things, including those that we look around and love and behold and have served under and served with, pastors out in the world, if I'm telling you that all of them have fallen short of these things, what then makes the bishop, the deacon, the prophet, the teacher any different? My thinking is, is that there is a difference, not in the fact that they've checked some lists and now they are, they are more holy than the rest, Though, by and large, they ought to be living an above-reproach lifestyle. As an example of the believers, they ought to be like the pinnacle of it, wouldn't you say? Okay. But what makes them different is not that they've checked the list and they're living righteously and they're doing, by and large, good things, even on this list and even back in the law and all these sorts of uh, expectations that are put on the believer at large. It's not because they've checked the list, but it's because of the call on their life. Okay, and we get a little nervous with that word call, and I understand. I've been to revival meetings where, where these preachers will come down and they'll talk about the call of God on their life, and they get all spooky, and they talk about how, you know, the lights dimmed, and then they saw a vision in the night, and then God spoke to them in an audible word. And, you know, you hear all these call stories that are a little spooky and a little bit like whoa that's it's a little intense and i think what happens is these guys had a really good feeling and they just kind of exaggerate as the years go on if you listen to an evangelist probably 10 years ago and you listen to him today his call has probably went from you know a knock on the door hey you want to serve god to just like the whole side of the house ripped off and then there was an angel standing there like it just gets exaggerated and played on the more and more time goes on right of course so we get nervous about that term the call of God. But it's absolutely scripture, and I believe that's the difference, and that's the thing that sets 
bishops and deacons and prophets apart from the rest, but it also isn't exclusive to them because there's also, and if you look in 2 Corinthians, I believe, there are gifts that are given to every member of the body. So every member of the body has a particular call for their life, a particular thing that God set them aside to fulfill and to do. So the difference of the bishops, deacons, and prophets and teachers is that their calling is to fulfill a particular uh, job, responsibility, office in the church. But they're not above the church. They're, they're sinners just like the rest of them. They're falling short of their own list that some, some of us call qualifications. And when doing so, we disqualify ourselves and we miss a very important part of what God is trying to teach us. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. It still carries over into the offices of bishops and deacons. I believe that. And I believe we all need the grace of God. And even in fulfilling things like patient, not a brawler. Can I just never, ever get into a, an altercation and then I'm just disqualified? You know, there's, there's certain things on there that are subject to kind of a scale and an interpretation and understanding. So it's the call then, I believe, that is just as important a deciding factor in the ministry. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 13. We're already there, okay? It says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Watch this. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee, by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now, does this seem like a qualification that someone worked towards? Or does this seem like an opportunity, a calling that someone was gifted without working for it at all? We talk about it all the time when we're at the door. A gift costs you what? Nothing. How much do you work for it? Nada. Okay? So that's where it makes a little bit more sense that what's happening here to Timothy is the acknowledgement of a gift that God put in him when he called him to the work that he is doing. Okay? He's to be an example of the believers, of course. Now he's being encouraged to neglect not the gift that is in thee by the Apostle Paul, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly unto them, that thy profiting, that they benefit, right, might appear unto all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt save thyself and them that hear me. And what you hear here, to me, just in those short verses, is way more profitable and beneficial than a few passages later, me taking a checklist and just trying to check them all off. Because this encompasses that. Meditating upon these things. What? These doctrines, these requirements, these expectations of a man in your position. Take heed to thyself. And always, always be on guard and prepared unto the doctrine. Continuing in the doctrine. Being steadfast. When you do that, the Bible says here that you'll save thyself and then that here. Not, not salvation, though that also counts. But you'll save yourself. You'll spare yourself. You will be living a right life. And you'll be encouraging others as an example of the believers. That is faithful Christianity. And that's, I believe, the by and large what God expects of his believers as well as those in the office of a bishop, a deacon, a prophet, a teacher. There is a gift here given by prophecy. In the context, we have uh, Titus, or Timothy, sorry, receiving that from his mom and from his grandmother who they taught him from a young age the scriptures so where does that gift come from them by prophecy preaching right go to go to uh go to uh proverbs 31 you're going to find the proverbs 31 uh woman but that is something to solomon given by his mom as a prophecy there's no end times events there it's preaching and teaching about how to find a good wife to a son and the same thing we're finding here is that prophecy is how he was given the gift. Mom, grandma gave him from a young age the word. And that's how he received of that gift, that, that gift from God, that calling. And it says here, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. So the gift was given, that call was given. Then afterwards came the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Them acknowledging what? The gift and the call. That's what the presbytery or the board of elders or the, uh, the leadership recognized in him. 
Neglect not the gift that you received from prophecy and was accompanied with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. So remember, we're talking about that as a foundation, the foundation of laying on of hands. Bear with me now. We're going to go to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, <clears throat> Old Testament prophet talking about the call of God and how it leads into the laying on of hands. Actually, how it's also one and the same. Isaiah chapter 1 through 5. You're going to find Isaiah preaching and teaching and exhorting and rebuking with all long suffering and doctrine in the nation of Israel. Go to chapter 6. Now he's out and he's preaching hard against the sins of the people. He, he's, he's talking about the glory of God. He's saying, woe unto the wicked. He's saying, you're, you're like Sodom. You're hiding not your sins. Woe unto their souls. They have rewarded evil unto themselves. He's talking about how the daughter of Zion is haughty, and he's just ripping, whoa, 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 to the people in chapter 5. Then we get to chapter 6. Remember, we're on the heels now of him already involved in the ministry. Do you know what that tells me? There was already a gift of prophecy given unto him. He doesn't just come out and start preaching and ripping on the whole nation and saying, Woe unto them that wise in their eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light and light for darkness and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. He doesn't just come out and do that unless he's been given a gift of prophecy, a given a gift of the preaching of the word of God. Given the word of God just from the beginning, he has that. And then on the heels of that, after the gift of prophecy is received, it goes with the laying on of hands all the time. Chapter 6 and verse 1. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his faith, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Notice the preacher, the prophet here, sees a vision of God, and the first thing he thinks is, I'm undone. I'm not capable. I'm not able. I'm not qualified. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now look at this in verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. A man unclean, a man undone, a man that knew he wasn't good enough to continue on in what he was doing when he saw the face of God coming to his presence and what? Touching him. A live coal in the hands of an angel touching the man of God here. Okay, so there is the call of God and it came on the heels of the gift of prophecy and it came with a touch upon the lips. Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah chapter 1. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 1, another example, the words of Jeremiah the son of Hilkiah of the priests which were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. Came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah of Judah, of, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem. Verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, now watch this, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, I'm, I'm qualified for this job. Of course you selected me. Look, I'm, I'm adding to the scriptures, but, but the, I'm just trying to, trying to jest a little bit here. Of course Jeremiah didn't say that. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, 
Behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. What was he lacking? Boldness, courage, age. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant his ministry very clearly given to him this is your call jeremiah don't say you can't do this because you can why because god takes his words and puts them in the mouth of the prophet by how the laying on of hands the touch the lord laid his hands on the mouth of the prophet whom he called that same prophet that admittedly says i'm not qualified to do this i'm just a child i'm not capable i'm not able he becomes able in the power of god ezekiel ezekiel chapter one ezekiel chapter one we were there a few weeks ago so i will try not to belabor this after jeremiah lamentations ezekiel chapter one we're going to find in chapter 1 the visions. Here he receives that gift of prophecy. Some end days things, some great visions that come to his mind. You can go back and read these. Chapter 2, look at verse 1. It says, And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet. Most the Lord reached out and took him, and set him upon his feet. A touch that I heard him that spake unto me. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me, and they and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted. I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear, whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall they know that there hath been a prophet among them. Here, God gives the call again after the gift of prophecy already came upon the man, and he gives the call with the touch, a laying on of his own hands in the prophet. Chapter 3 and verse 4 says, And he said unto me, Son of man, go! Get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. The very clear commission that so many prophets and preachers throughout time, even unto this day, have been given to go and speak the word of God. And these men were very humble in their reception of that commission and call. Ezekiel fell on his face. Isaiah said, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm not worthy. Jeremiah said, I'm a child. I'm inexperienced. I can't do this. Now, is this just Old Testament? Are these just things that are examples written for our learning upon whom the ends of the world are come? In part, yeah. But does this transcend into New Testament doctrine? Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. You'll find at the very end of your Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, right before Matthew, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger. Behold, I will send my messenger. And he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come into his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Go over to Malachi 4 in verse 5. Malachi 4 verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. What's this talking about? Anybody know? John the Baptist. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. A few, one book to the right. Mark chapter 1 and verse 1 says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. 
John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. So what do you have here? You have a prophecy in Old Testament in the book of Malachi, which is recorded precisely in Mark chapter 1 and verse 2. So there was the gift that came by prophecy bestowed upon a specific man. Now what you have here is Mark recording this, essentially acknowledging that's the case. He says, this is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. When God said, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee, he was talking about John the Baptist. This is Mark signifying that that is, essentially, he's putting his hands on it. He, he's, he's saying, yep, this is the guy. Continue on chapter 5, it says, And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair, and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preach, saying, There cometh, now look at it, again, remember, the order is prophecy, and then afterwards the laying on of hands, right? The prophecy comes first as a gift. Here's the preaching of John the Baptist. As he was prophesied that he would do in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1 he is now saying verse 7 there cometh one mightier than I after me the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose I indeed have baptized you with water but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost now watch this and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John and Jordan and straightway coming up out of the water he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him upon him is the spirit it's hand the spirit's wings the spirit as a dove okay so what do we have here the prophecy of Malachi points to John John fulfills it Mark puts his hands on and says yeah I accept that then John comes out and he prophesies of one that will come afterwards, lays his hands on him as he baptizes him, raises him up, and then what happens? The Spirit itself comes down, bears witness, laying his hands upon Jesus Christ himself, ordaining the ministry that's to come. <clears throat> I'm talking still about the foundation of the laying on of hands. You see how that is the beginning of these things. Prophecy comes as a gift revealing what the call of God will be. The laying on of hands signifies that this is true and essentially kicks off the commission. Now we know that John couldn't, John laid his hands on him and baptized him. Jesus Christ himself could only have hands laid on him by none other than God himself. And so that dove came down and just signified. And then what happened there in verse 11? He's got a double fold. Hands laying on, signifying this is the guy. This is the Lord. In verse 11 it says, And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Spirit comes and puts his hands upon the Lord. And then finally, from heaven comes the acknowledgement of God that this is the Son of God that was prophesied of so long ago. Now I do have here the best case for this New Testament, ordination, appointment to ministry, the, the prophecy that turns to the laying on of hands is coupled with the laying on of hands. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. I've got half a page left. Acts chapter 13. Beginning in verse 1, Acts chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius and Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Okay, so Saul here is being basically called out from the group. There's N. Saul. He's, 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 he's the final name mentioned here, and the one we're going to begin focusing on. So, a prophet, a teacher, and certainly so, the Bible records here. Now, who gave the apostle, sorry, who gave Saul at this time the authority to be in that um, office of prophet and teacher at the church, which was at Antioch? 
Go back to Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. Keep your finger in Acts 13. Acts 9 and verse 10, it says, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints in Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call upon thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. It seems the authority to be a prophet came by the hand of God here. The Lord sent his man. And the Lord is the one that said, Go thy way, he is a chosen vessel unto me. He will bear my name. He will hold my name. He will see, He will be seen holding my name before the Gentiles. Verse 16 says, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, sent me that he might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. He received sight forthwith, arose, and was baptized. So here we have the Holy Ghost being received at the laying on of hands of Ananias. Ananias comes in the power of God to show Paul that he is a chosen vessel, to show Paul that he will be bearing the name of God before the Gentiles, to show Paul that his ministry and his call would be to suffer much for the sake of the Lord. This is God's calling here then. Now go back to Acts chapter 13 and verse 2. Remember, we have Acts chapter 13, a group of certain prophets and teachers. They're named here. We know who they are. The church knew who they were. They were in the church, which was at Antioch, a prominent church at the time. Verse 2 says, as they ministered to the Lord. So these were ministering. They were working. They were already laboring in the things that are being discussed here. And fasted, it says this, the Holy Ghost said. Who said? The Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Who called Paul and Barnabas at this time? The Holy Ghost. Very clearly, the call of God, the call of the Holy Ghost to separate these ministers, prophets, and teachers in the church came from the Holy Ghost. Verse 3 says, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So here's the pattern. The prophecy comes. The gift comes comes. They're already working in those gifts, laboring in those gifts. Then the Holy Ghost says, God says, separate these men. I have called them. Then the church does what? The church at Antioch fasts, prays, lays their hands on them, and sends them away. So it says here, fasting, praying, done by the church at the leadership and call of the Holy Ghost, sends them on their way. Verse 4 then, so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost? Didn't it just say the church was the one that sent them forth? No, now it's, it's clear. The church was simply laying on of hands and authorizing, approving, accepting, signifying, yep, this is the case, putting their stamp of approval in what they have seen on what they have already witnessed the Holy Ghost has done. The Holy Ghost called, the Holy Ghost sent. So then... The church saw, sent, laid on in hands. Now, it, what is this at this time? Because it says clearly the church sent, then it says the Holy Ghost sent. This whole laying on of hands, this, this thing almost, almost seems like it's a formality at this point to what God had already done when he appointed the man, called the man, sent a man of God there to his place to give him sight, to tell him his calling, to give his appointment, and to send him on his way. His ministry was one of prophecy. 
And he had already been showing his heart of that ministry to date. That's what you see here. And so the laying on of hands is then signifying what God is already doing. It's the church sending by their approval, by the authority bestowed upon the church, through the hands of the elders, Titus and Timothy tell us, the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, the, the elders, those ones essentially able and willing to judge in such matters, they had saw the general works and labors and characteristics and qualities that, yes, you can find in those qualifications, qualities of the bishop. They saw those and you know why they were there, though, in the first place? Because the Holy Ghost had already worked them in. The Apostle Paul, three chapters ago, wasn't the prophet and teacher that he is now in chapter 13. God called him, put work into him, called him to a specific ministry, was preparing to send him forth, and as he did, the church recognized and said, yep, I agree, laid on hands, sent him out, okay? Specifically the elders, specifically, as we saw in Titus and, and Timothy, they were qualified and able to go and perform such a task. Here in the context of the church, church at Antioch, referring, of course, to their ministry of being prophets and teachers, going out as, as seemingly an evangelistic ministry, the authority was given to the church by the Holy Ghost, but the call and the sending was God's entirety. God calls, separates, sanctifies, and sends his men. The bishops then, we see then, are an example of the church as a body of something that they would esteem well, suitable, enough to go, but the decision-making was entirely God's. The church just simply came to the realization that, yep, that's the case, after they'd prayed and after they'd fasted and after they'd essentially signified that that's the case. So again, this, this, this doctrine, there's probably a lot more of it, the foundation of the laying on of hands. <clears throat> but what I want to really grasp here is that, first and foremost, qualification of the bishop apply to us all. We're all called to a higher form of living. Some of us unto helps, some of us unto preaching the gospel, some of us unto ministry, some of us unto teaching. All of those things God appoints. You've got to find out what it is. When you're saved, I believe God put that in your heart. Hey, just ask him for it. What am I called to do? What should I do, Lord? And then work at that, labor at that, struggle at that. Try to ask God to sanctify you and work with you and build you up to where you are essentially ready to be called. For the Apostle Paul, it took from chapters 8 to chapter 13 to be called and sent into his ministry. And the key here, again, for all of this, is there's no lone rangers. They're in the church. They're already working in the church. They're serving in the church. It was the church that came together and recognized who God had called and recognized who God was sending, and they simply laid on their hands and sent him to go and do that duty and perform that task. This was God's laying on of hands. And it comes with a call. And we often neglect and negate that call. Look, I, nothing spooky happened. But when I was saved, that moment I was saved, I just felt impressed that I was going to preach. I don't know why. I wasn't prepared for that. I wasn't a public speaker. None of that. But when I was saved and I believed on Christ, I asked him to save me from judgment to come. In that moment, I knew that I was called unto preaching. I think every one of us has that call in our life. We have something that God wants us to do. The Holy Ghost is working in us to get us to that direction. But we're all going to sin. We're all going to fall short. None of us are qualified for the ministry that God has for us. You know what we have to do? Work as hard as we can to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Let God fill in the gaps. You know, the things that we just can't do. The things that we just can't bring up enough, muster enough in ourselves to, to work it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but all sinners who are saved can and will be used by God if they simply submit themselves to his plan. Amen? All right, thank you, Father.